Welcome to the session on the future of technology. My name is Emma, and I'll be your moderator today. I'm one of the youth delegates here at Future Talks. Um, actually, the day before yesterday, I finished my master's degree in international development and humanitarian emergencies at the London School of Economics. Thank you. Um, so I'm just happy to have my head out of a book today. But before my master's and all throughout it, I founded four tech companies, which have been focused on disrupting the way humanitarian aid is imagined and delivered. So I'm thrilled to be here and to be able to learn from these inspiring women. Um, over the last week, as I've been finishing my master's dissertation, I've been working from the remote island where I grew up in the San Juan Islands. Tucked in the heart of the Salish Sea, my homeland is a cornucopia of biodiversity and wildlife. Yet for the third year in a row, this beauty was threatened by the combined smoke from wildfires in British Columbia and in California that had gotten trapped lingering in our archipelago. It actually grew so thick that I couldn't see my bike parked at the end of my driveway, and going outside became hazardous. With every passing year, in the more vulnerable or fragile parts of the world such as these, it is becoming more obvious that our planet and many of the beings in it are suffering. And things are only going to get worse. In terms of resources, if global population reaches its estimated 9.1 billion by 2050, world food production will need to rise by 70%. In terms of environment, even if all countries fulfill their pledges from the 2015 Paris Agreement, it would only account for one-third of the needed em emission, sorry, reduction em in emissions to keep the Earth below two degrees. In terms of humanitarianism, we have not seen numbers of displaced people this high since World War II. Yet, we are entering the most powerful era of innovation the world has ever seen. In terms of resources, we can look to the example of gene editing from the technique CRISPR, which can grow corn that produces even more grain under drought conditions and does not lose yield during, uh, sorry, and does not lose yield when it's well watered. In terms of the environment, we can look to the Canadian company, General Fusion, who is creating a commercially viable nuclear fusion energy power plant with no risk of meltdown or long-lived waste, yet enough fusion fuel to power the planet for hundreds of millions of years. Finally, in terms of humanitarian aims, there are the three powerful women we'll get to hear from today. Ruman, advising companies on ethical AI practices. Samantha, working on civil uh, civic and social activism through technology, and Julia building technologies like brain interfaces and artificial intelligence that transform society. We're not just taking steps forward, we're taking leaps. As computer scientist and unrelenting futurist uh, Ray Craswell says, we won't experience 100 years of progress in the 21st century. It will be more like 20,000 years of progress at today's rate. Technology could be the greatest force for good that we've ever known but it could also be a force for ill. While some drones are built to deliver food supplies to famine-threatened regions, others are used to carry weapons. While some cryptocurrencies are sent to refugees, others are sent to criminals on the dark web. So we must remember to be kind, to be good. We need to fight for the technology revolution to be a peaceful one. We need to use our creative toolkits to bring out the moral heartbeat of our humanity. It is our global commitment to innovation that will sustain this planet and the people on it. The pessimists say we're running out of time, but the technologists, like these, say we're just getting started. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for joining the, the session today. We are thrilled to hear from these three pioneers working on frontier technologies. The first of these today will be Julia Bosman, who's an AI strategist and director of strategy at Fatham Computing, a startup to build optical computer to build an optical computer for machine learning, and serves at the World Economic Forum as a council member for artificial intelligence and robotics. Previously, she was president at Foresight Institute, a leading organization for world-changing technologies, co-founded Anticipate Analytics, a prediction startup in the energy sector, and conducted research on the coming technologies at Bosque Research Technology. She is a McKinsey Fellow, Singularity University GSP graduate, and World Economic Forum Global Shaper. Her academic background is in neuroscience and psychology, where she holds a Master of Science with the highest honors. She speaks and consults about AI, innovation, the future, and how technology transforms society. So please join me in welcoming her to the stage today. Hi, everyone. 
thank you so much for coming here. Um, I'm going to give you, if this works, all right. I'm going to give you a brief introduction into what artificial intelligence is. Um, you probably all have a pretty good idea of it now, hence uh, who does not know what artificial intelligence is. All right, everyone else probably has a vastly different uh, assumption of what it might be, but I'm gonna go into it really briefly. So the way I see it is that we have built horses that are faster than any naturally born horse. And we have been able to build artificial birds that can go faster and further than any organically born bird that we see here on Earth. And um, now we are building artificial brains that are more powerful than any natural brain. And if we call this um, flight, then we would also call the brains, you know, synthetic brains, because otherwise we would need to call this artificial flight. And um, so artificial intelligence, in a nutshell, is getting a computer to achieve goals without explicitly instructing it how to do it. So in the old paradigm of how we would program a computer, we would have like a recipe, which we call an algorithm, which say, do this, then do that, then do this, and if not, then do that again. And with artificial intelligence, instead we're building something that is akin to the neural networks we have in our brains, um, but are simulated on a computer. And instead of telling it all the rules, what it should do, we give it some input and we give it the goals that it's supposed to achieve um, and how it measures how close it's getting to achieving those goals. And then whenever it gets closer to the goals, um, it can keep that state and otherwise it will change some things around in the knobs and try again. So it's a very computing intensive, lots of, in a way, trial and error process. And it has led to really interesting <coughs> results recently, which makes lots of people really excited about it. So. Um, just a quick example from, from art. art. <laughs> Here we have um, a famous Norwegian painter that you probably all know. Um, I took a picture of myself with a friend at Burning Man, and the computer learned everything about this painter and then painted the photograph in the same style. Here, a computer was given all the works of Shakespeare and then was then asked to come up with something that sounds like Shakespeare. And if you read it, you might think, hmm, this does kind of sound like Shakespeare. I wonder which piece it is from. And it doesn't make any sense after a while. It's from no piece, but it's, um, it learned that style and learned to apply it to novel things. So this is an art. In uh, games, there were also really big uh, progress made. So this is AlphaGo, which was a um, program programmed by DeepMind, which is part of Google. And um, Go was seen as one of the most complex games that humanity collectively ever came up with. And as you know, we've had uh, a computer beat Garry Kasparov, the greatest chess player, about a decade ago, and other games also have been beaten. But we thought with Go, it would have been at least 10 years out. So um, experts put it at around 2025 when we would actually beat Go with machines. And this actually happened two years ago now that it has been beaten. So we were wildly off on the timelines. And um, here's an example of a computer also from DeepMind playing the game Breakout. And what's interesting about this is, uh, first of all, it had, no, it had been given no information about the game other than the score and the screen output. So it doesn't know what a paddle was. It doesn't know what a ball is and what it does. It had to learn all of that by itself from scratch with basically trial and error. And what you can see is that at some point it figures out to get into the back and hit all the balls from the back and that will give it a better score much faster. So they are able to at some point innovate and even get better than a normal casual human player. This also happened with chess where um, Google's AlphaZero beat um, the world's best chess players and also the world's most advanced chess computer which had decades of research into it and this was built in less than a year upon all the other uh, AI advances and was trained also in a fairly short amount of time. And the thing that was really stunning about the chess computer is that there are, um, in chess, the moves are classified in certain categories and there are certain moves that the grandmasters will do and people who are familiar with chess can recognize them and see like how 
how masterful they are. And as this machine was learning by itself to play chess, at some point it started showing these moves and played on the grandmaster level. But what happened afterwards, to me, was even more stunning because at some point it stopped doing these grandmaster moves and did completely novel new moves that no human had ever done before. So it had basically outranked the human grandmasters and had a new creative approach to playing chess that was just better than any human. So in a way, you know, I was trying everything first and then found a new way <laughs> of doing it. Let's see one more. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and I went into arts and into games, but it's also really useful in the business context. So, for example, this is a um, computer or uh, a bot that is available in the UK, and you can chat with it online, and it will tell you, um, it will help you basically draft legal letters. So you can say here, my flight was delayed, and it is asking for all your information, and then it will give you an automated letter that you can send off and get your refund. Or if you have a parking ticket, it will help you, you know, um, argue about that parking ticket. So basically, what you used to get a um, lawyer for in the past, which is really expensive and only accessible to um, basically the upper strata of our society can now be available to basically everyone with an internet connection. Here's another example of uh, something I've been using personally, which is a electronic assistant, and this is basically an AI bot who will schedule meetings for me. So somebody was emailing me, and this bot who is, who is called Andrew, but there's also the female version <laughs> for people who want the other one, um, will email the person who wants a meeting with me and will tell them when I'm available and go back and forth. And then once it's been done, it will send a calendar invite to both of us. So all this work that is somewhat repetitive, but also somewhat not super easily to automate will basically be available with AI. Um, and if you're thinking about jobs now, you're right on the money because I've been thinking about that too. So this is the list of the most um, popular or the most numerous jobs in the United States and how many workers are in them each. So we can, we can look at, at all of these, but even if we look just at the top one, transportation, we already know that self-driving cars are reality now and they're here to stay. And um, all of these workers might be displaced at some point. And what we are not really keeping in mind about this is that um, if the transportation business goes away or if it goes over to machines in the United States, there are big swaths of um, the landscape, the countryside basically, that is catering to the transportation economy. So there are motels, there are diners, um, you know, all the station and entertainment along the road. All of this is basically uh, its whole um, small economy that is based on humans driving goods around and all of this um, will basically lose its foundation once we don't need humans on the road anymore. Which, um, to be fair, is probably a good thing for the people because um, there are still lots of deaths from car accidents um, and machines don't get distracted on the road, they don't text and drive, uh, they don't get tired. So um, there are some very reasonable concerns about this on either side. Um, the thing that we really need to solve about this is sustenance. So how do these people um, basically participate in our economy once um, this is all different? So today, as you all know, there's basically two ways to participate in the economy. Either you sell your time, and if you have a valuable skill, then you can sell your time for more, or you own something, and then you can participate in the economy by selling the things you own and hope that they appreciate and depreciate and so on. Um, and once we have machines that are able to do most of the work that humans can do, then this part will go away. And only the people who have ownership can participate in our economy. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, what do we want to do about this? And what kind of world do we want to live in um, where we can all participate in the economy and um, basically our society and civilization can flourish. And there are different models about this. So one, I was born and raised in Germany and when I was born, the um, East Germany communist regime was still in power. And what my mom used to tell me is that there was zero unemployment rate in the DDR. 
So you had the one person kind of just distributing leaflets in the street, then you had the next person mop it all up in the street, then you had another person go through the same street again and sweep the same street again, um, and all for the purpose of having this zero unemployment rate. And the idea was that everyone needs to have some kind of occupation because it was somehow considered immoral or um, undesirable to not be full-time employed. And do we really want that? If we have a, if we have a world where um, it is not necessary that every person spends most of their waking time doing something, not because they want to intrinsically do it, but because that's what they need to do in order to you know, pay the rent and basically live, um, is that the world we want to have? Or can we imagine a different world where we will flourish? And um, this guy, Edward Bellamy, was a futurist in the late 19th century. So he wrote this book in 1887, which was a bestseller at the time. It sold a million copies, which was a huge deal uh, back in the day. And it was basically about the year 2000. And he got a lot of things right. So he, um, he foresaw Wikipedia and iTunes and the internet and 3D printing, all kinds of things. And the one thing that he got wrong was that he thought we would live in a utopia where everyone live, works roughly four hours max per week. So he might have been like a past relative of Tim Ferriss. But um, he thought that the economic upside that we are creating with technology and especially with automation and artificial intelligence um, would benefit all of society and all of the nations basically. And right now, the way our system is set up, that is not the case, as we all know. So if, if a startup is founded that can automate a certain task, then all the economic upside of that task is captured by the startup, not by the people who used to do that task. And that is the, that goes at the kind of uh, nut of the problem. So yeah, this guy doesn't share our obsession with jobs, and we want to, um, I would like all of us to ask ourselves, you know, what, how do we think about this? Do we really need to have jobs, or can we think of something else? Um, there are also these experiments going on with basic income, which are really interesting, which we don't have the time to go into in this talk, but maybe in the interactive Q&A. And basically, this um, conversation takes a lot of courage, because we also need to think uh, for ourselves what does our identity mean? Because when we ask someone today um, what they do, they often say, I am a doctor or I am a lawyer, not, you know, I do doctor things some time of my day, but I am this. So that we, we think of our profession as our identity. And um, we may live in our future where that is not so easily the case anymore. We already see with millennials in the gig economy that we go from one gig to another, and our identity needs to be based on completely new things. Um, and this is, this is a development that we can't reverse, we can't turn back the clock on it, it won't go away. So we all need to have the courage to face these conversations. Thank you. Mm.